Good afternoon. Thank everyone for joining us today. Today we are here for the Laughlin Town Advisory Board, September 10th, 2024. We will now start our agenda. Items on the agenda. I gotta move this back. That's kind of loud. <laughs> Items on the agenda may be taken out of order. The board may continue can, may combine two or more of the agenda items for consideration. The board may remove an item for the from the agenda or delay discussion relating to the item at any time. No action may be taken on any matter not listed on the posted agenda. All planning and zoning matters heard at this meeting are forwarded to the Board of County Commissioner Zoning Commission, the BCC, or Clark County Planning, PC, for final action. Please turn off or mute all cell phones and electronic devices. Please take all private <coughs> conversations outside the room. With the 48-hour advance request, a sign language interpreter or other re reasonable efforts to assist and accommodate persons with physical disabilities may be made available by calling 702-455-3530 or TDD at 702-385-7486 or Relay Nevada toll free at 800-326-6868. <clears throat> Supporting material provided to the board members for this meeting may be requested from Tammy Harris at 702-298-0828. Supporting material will also be available at Clark County Department Administrative Services. <clears throat> Supporting material will be available at the county's website at clarkcountynv.gov slash TAB. Our first item on the agenda, we'll call, roll call. Kathy Oates? Here. Fred Doughton? Here. Pam Walker? Here. Herm Walker? No Here. relation. We are all in attendance. Our secretary is Tammy Harris, 702 298 0828. Or email is tammy.harris at clarkcountynv.gov. County liaison is Mark Moskowitz, 702. 2980828 or 7024556173 or his email at mark.moskowich m o s k o w i t z at clarkcountynv.gov Will you all please stand and join us in the pledge of allegiance Pam I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> Item number two, the public comments. This is a period devoted to comments by the general public about items on this agenda. No discussion, action, or vote may be taken on this agenda item. You will be afforded the opportunity to speak on individual public hearing items at the time that they are presented. If you wish to speak to the board about items within this jurisdiction, but not appearing on this agenda, you must wait until the comments of general public period listed at the end of this agenda. Comments will be limited to three minutes. Please step up to the speaker's podium. Clearly state your name, address, and spell your last name for the record. If any member of the board wishes to extend the length of your presentation, this will be done by the chairperson for a majority vote. Welcome. Sorry, that's all right. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Patricia Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R. I'm from 3179 Quail Song Drive. 
My questions, and that's why I wanted to ask them at the beginning so they can be addressed, concern <coughs> item two under general business, using the Fort Mojave Trust Fund money to pay for a water storage tank needed by developers. In previous public meetings on this issue, assurances were given based on the facts that were known then that existing residents would not pay for building new storage because as we all know, growth is supposed to pay for growth. Because today's proposal seems like a departure from those assurances, I have two questions I hope will be addressed. First, I want some assurance that the Water District has really ruled out all alternatives which could allow the possible affordable senior housing project to move forward on its own track if it does proceed. For example, I had asked whether any out of date will serve letters could be revised to free up enough capacity to allow that project to move forward. Second, because the proposed funding is characterized as a loan, and I think it as a fiduciary, the commission has to make it on commercially reasonable terms. It seems that existing water customers will be on the hook at a minimum for the interest during the 30 year term of the loan. So they will be paying for the storage tank despite having been told that existing Laughlin residents would not be charged for that. Even worse, if the federal grants aren't available, and only the companies who are currently requesting service pay connection fees, this loan will not be repaid in full by the Water District. In essence, the Fort Mojave Trust Fund will be rated to support and benefit private developments. Um, if my understanding is accurate, and that's really what I'm looking for is a, is a reality check on it, uh, I think that would set a horrible precedent for a fund that's designed to benefit all of Laughlin. We need to remember that water ratepayers include people like low-income seniors, renters who can't even afford to buy a house. I think our current Laughlin residents deserve to be protected from having their water rates increase to cover debt service and then having a trust fund that's entitled to benefit them almost exhausted to pay for a project that, in my opinion, doesn't necessarily benefit the community as a whole. Now, I sincerely wish the marina and the developer good luck in pursuing their projects. I think they're good for the city. But I don't feel, however, that Laughlin taxpayers should be subsidizing these uh, developments, which are private developments, whether indirectly or directly. Uh, I'd personally like to see the Fort Mojave Trust Fund reserved for any development which yields permanent, good-paying jobs for our residents or for something that clearly benefits the whole community. In the past, it's been used for the Silver Rider Terminal, Food Bank, items like that. I apologize for going over my time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, approval of minutes for August 13th. I'll move. Madam Chair. If I may, um, on our August 13th meeting, and possibly a little bit on the 27th, but there was a great deal of, uh, you know, real estate covered during that time frame, and a great deal of uh, terminology and input from the water district and also this board. Um, I do know that the media and also some of the stakeholders along Casino Drive have requested of the county office a digital copy um, of that meeting. Um, and as of Friday, I wasn't able to check this morning or, or yesterday, but Monday being what Monday is, they had not been able to do that yet. So I was asking if we could hold the approval of the minutes for August 13th and August 27th until they have a chance to review those and input with the with county staff. So I can just uh, touch on that item. We've, uh, anyone that has requested the meet the meeting minutes, we've provided them to them. We've provided um, them immediately after that meeting on the 14th, and then again this morning. So, um, but it's up to the board's discretion if you want to hold the minutes. So. I just don't think they've had an opportunity to review them. It was lengthy, so okay. I think I yeah. think they're just a little bit more time for sure. that. I just want to clarify for the record that we've got. Madam Chair. Okay. Can I make the motion to hold those? Yes. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. 
We will hold the minutes from thir August 13th and August 27th to our next general meeting. Okay, let's move on to the approval of the agenda for September 10th, 2024. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Opposed? <clears throat> motion carried. Okay, let's move on to our informational items. Number one, receive a report and updates from the South County Liaison, Mark Mosiewicz. Perfect, thank you, Chair. If you wanna bring up the PowerPoint presentation. Um, we had a few updates this month, so should be coming up shortly. Um, we first had the Coffee with the Cop at uh, Bruce's Taste of Chicago. I always wanna thank Lieutenant Rogers and Sergeant Cox for inviting our office and letting us be a part of the, this community out reach program, it's really great to just be able to meet with our constituents. Um, it was a nice environment and a really good turnout, so thank you as always, and also to Renee as well. Um, second thing is the Small Business Administration from Washington, D.C. came out, and I wanna thank um, Kathy Oaks on our board. She and I sat on a round table um, with uh, the administrator, Isabel Guzman, and Susie Lee to really talk about small business and small business opportunities in Laughlin. Um, it was a very, uh, a very engaging conversation. Um, a lot of good information was shared. As always, please reach out to our office if you'd like any connections, if you're looking at opening a business or need small business help. Um, we had a lot of good contacts, and there's also a resource fair as well after Wednesdays, that. yep. Yep, yep. Um, I wanna update everyone. So on September 28th is um, National Public Lands Day, and I wanna thank both uh, Kathleen and Fred on our board. They are members of our Carl River Heritage Greenway Park Trail Advisory Council. We'll be uh, hosting the National Public Lands Day at Pyramid Canyon uh, Park, and that'll be from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. There's gonna be kite flying, pollination seed balls, so we're gonna make some seed balls that are actually gonna, which I learned from you in our extension today, will help with all the wild, wildfires to kind of start replanting some stuff. There'll be some treasure hunts, animal exhibits, nature, nature walks, and there's also gonna be food. So um, you'll be getting a lot more information in the coming days, but I want to kind of get the, save the date out there for everyone. I also wanted to update um, everyone that the Laughlin Residential uh, Roads project that was kind of put on pause due to the extreme summer temperatures. Out of the safety of the workers as well as the quality of the work, if it gets too hot, which is interesting, it'll actually not set correctly. So um, there was a brief pause. However, everything is still on schedule. It'll be completed by the end of the year, if earlier. And um, they've started at backup work on September 4th. And um, on the left side, those are those little flyers you'll start to see on your door hangers for areas. So as always, please look out for your neighbors. I know it gets windy around here. So if one flies off, let them know. These were pictures I was sent uh, yesterday of work that's been starting already. So you can see, you're gonna see a lot of heavy equipment out there. So um, please be on the lookout. And as always, call our office if anything doesn't seem right or looks weird or if tools are left on a site that does happen so we can always get in contact with public work so um, and then the last two more things I um, I just want to let everyone know we've got newsletters in the back um, so just let us know if you'd like an electronic copy lots of good information so um, keep that in mind and also I know tomorrow is September 11th so I just want to have everyone remember to take a moment of remembrance you know thank our first responders because they're the ones that go into those situations and just uh, be there for everyone tomorrow. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to receive a report from Lieutenant Rogers with Metro Police. Hello, board, thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, if you haven't noticed, our uniforms have changed. So we do wear black pants now. So just uh, in case you see us in the community and you think that we're strangers, we're still the same police department. So it's out of uniform, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just put a little public service announcement uh, for the sheriff, we now wear black pants. So we're, we're excited and hopefully it's not too hot while we're here working. So we'll see how it goes. Um, I'll cover our stats. Um, for last month, for August 2024, we handled 287 calls for service. It's down 3%. Uh, sorry, excuse me, up 3% from last year, but uh, significantly down from the month prior. So uh, I think as summer ends, everyone's back to school, um, we, we do see a little bit of a drop off in calls for service, uh, which is good. It gives us more time to be uh, engaged with the community and other uh, adventures. 
Uh, last month we wrote 157 uh, traffic citations, uh, had two arrests for DUI, uh, four arrests for battery domestic violence, and a total of 22 arrests at our Tucker Holding facility here, which encompasses all jurisdictions that use our facility. Uh, we had five calls for service at the high school, the new uh, Bennett Elementary and High School all is on one campus, so that is good for us. Uh, from a safety standpoint, we also met with the principal last week and conducted a safety drill on the new uh, Syntex safety system that they have, which is kind of a, where each teacher wears like a panic button now. Um, and it's almost like pulling a fire alarm, but it comes directly to the police department. So uh, that was something good to be uh, involved in and see firsthand, um, you know, that all of our children there at the school are very well protected. and. Uh, if there's something that does happen, then we immediately uh, are notified of an event and we can respond rather quickly. Uh, moving on to our, uh, or any questions on the stats at all before I move on to community events? Good, good, okay. Yep. Just gonna ask on uh, Bennett, now that that is, I mean, is that fully vacant, partially vacant? Are you guys in that area a lot more the, the former property there? The former property is vacant, yes. I'm not sure what the school district's plans for it are. Um, that's would, wouldn't that maybe Mark could. I was wondering, yeah, if staff could let us know what their their plans are for that, because otherwise, I mean, we could have start having a lot of juveniles and stuff over there in that area we, that you would have to deal with. Yeah, we still patrol it. I mean, it is fenced, and it's like it's like when school is in session. And I mean, it's there's a fence and it's locked. Obviously, I mean, I'm, kids do climb fences and that kind of stuff, but. Uh, we do patrol it, um, you know, at night and during our regular routine patrols. Um, I'm not aware of any calls there yet, but and I, I'm not sure what the plan for the property is. And, and I can follow up with the school district as well. I know they're still planning on using the building, so it should still have activity around with people going in there. Either it's going to be like a training facility or something for the school district, so it should not be a shuttered, vacant building, which right. would... And I just didn't know what they, their yeah. intents were. Yep, and I think they'll... Um, I can ask them for more information. I know that now that the elementary school is finally open, and they're all moved in there that now they'll start to probably do a little bit more stuff. But I'll continue to work with Lieutenant Rogers on if there's any issues of security or something like that, so. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Uh, yes, tomorrow is September 11th. Uh, we also decided to schedule our Coffee with a Cop event tomorrow. Um, so that will be at 11 a.m. It'll be at the Spirit Mount, uh, Spirit Mount Activity Center. Um, and we do have a guest speaker. I did mention it last month. We do have someone coming down from the Alzheimer's Association. So we do think it, uh, with our um, population here in Laughlin, uh, a lot of senior citizens, uh, if this is something that's affected you or your family or a friend, come, come out tomorrow. We want to have a big, uh, a, a big turnout. And then, if, like you said, if you have any questions or what's, you know, if you feel like you're lost with uh, how to handle family that are going through Alzheimer's, uh, we're going to have a lot of good resources there tomorrow. So if we could have a nice big turnout tomorrow at 11 o'clock, um, will be our Coffee with a Cop with our guest speaker. Um, moving on, our uh, national night out. We have a lot of, uh, uh, it's, our, it's our biggest event of the year. It will be on um, Wednesday, uh, October 9th. Uh, we did, normally it's the first week of October, but because of the October 1st memorial that's happening that week, uh, we did move it to the, to the second week of October. So on the 9th of October, we'll be um, at Mountain View Park where we are every year. Uh, we should have a good turnout. Um, like I said last month, uh, we do have a generous donation uh, you know, from uh, Gino Briscoe and Chris Jeter. Uh, we will have a petting zoo with some baby goats. So uh, if your day's not going well, a baby goat will make it better. <laughs> um, so yes, come out for that. And Renee um, is my community liaison extraordinaire. I give her a lot of titles, but she does a lot for us. So I just give her a quick shout out. Um, and the last thing, just to kind of put it on your calendar, Tuesday, October 29th, uh, once again at Mountain View Park will be our annual uh, Halloween trunk or treat event. Um, so if anybody's available, anyone wants to decorate their trunk, help pass out candy. Uh, we are looking for candy donations. I know most of the casinos do pretty well and they have me come by and pick up lots of candy. But if any, any small businesses or anyone in the community that doesn't necessarily feel like passing out candy at their own house and they want to buy just, you know, no donations too small, you want to buy one, small bag of candy and drop it off to the front counter here at our police station. Uh, we're open Monday through Friday, uh, eight to five. Uh, just feel free to drop it off and we'll help, we'll help pass it out for you. So that's our upcoming uh, trunk or treat event for the end of October. All right, any questions? No. Any questions? Questions? No. Okay. Nope. All right, thank, thank you. you, have a great day. Do you have a flyer on the national night out?
Is it in the back? I was going to say, are they on the back? Yeah, it's on. The, it's in the back. And the trunk or treat. Uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Hot off the presses. I know that the food bank had asked about if anybody had any donations of candy too, just simply because they give those out to people that maybe can't afford to have trick or treaters at their home. So I, I, I was asked for you know some donations, which we did some, but if I can drop them at the police station, that's fine too. So anyone who needs a flyer for National Not Act, you can see it on the back table. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to number three. We see a report from Clark County Fire Department. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Captain Tony Quintella. Clark County Fire Department, Station 76, which is just to the west of this building. Uh, Laughlin Civic Drive and Thomas Edison. And we also have one other station here in Laughlin, Station 85, which is at James Gilray Parkway, uh, just east of Needles. Uh, I'll go over the run responses for August of 2024. Uh, at Station 76, there was an, a fire engine, Engine 76. Uh, last month, that engine ran two calls for EMS service, two fire responses, three other types of responses for a total of seven responses for Engine 76. Rescue 76, which are, is our two-person uh, transport capable, for uh, lack of a better word, ambulance. Uh, it had 66 EMS responses last month, had two fire responses, four other type of responses, um, when I say other type of responses, typically that would be your traffic accidents, uh, a lot of elevator rescue and entrapment calls here in Laughlin at casinos. Um, so that would fit into your other type of response. Hiker in the middle of the desert with a broken ankle might be another. Uh, we also <coughs> have a truck, which is cross-manned. It's not permanently staffed or full-time staffed. If the call dictates a need for a truck, which is your basically an engine with a large aerial apparatus on top of it, 75 foot ladder. <clears throat> if the call would dictate a need for the truck, the crew would decide to man the truck instead of the uh, engine. Um, it's possible for us to take both as well um, and then to uh, reunify the crew on scene. The truck ran 17 EMS responses last month, eight fire responses, 17 other type of responses, for a subtotal of 42 calls for the truck. I apologize, that also includes Watercraft 76. We oh, have a, okay. So okay. Watercraft may have ran some of those calls. It doesn't break it down on the sheet how many were ran by the truck or how many were ran by the uh, Watercraft. We also have a tech rescue, specialty tech rescue uh, vehicle in the station, which is capable of uh, off-roading, four by four capability, which also has a trailer with a four-wheel drive capable side-by-side. -side. So if we had, for example, that hiker down in the middle of the desert, um, we would be able to take that four-wheel drive tech rescue off the paved surfaces onto the dirt roads to a point where if it even became more difficult for that tech rescue vehicle to access the patient, now we have the capability of a side-by-side. Side-by-side does have the capability of transporting or, or carrying four personnel, plus it has a uh, a litter in the back where we can load a patient in one patient or two it would have room for one patient okay need if it came to a need where we had to get two out we, we would do what we had to do right obviously right okay um so a total of 121 responses for station 76 in august of 2024 that's down 31 percent from august august of 2023 <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Station 85 um, had 51 EMS responses for service, eight fire responses, 10 other types of responses for a total of 69, uh, 69 total calls for that engine. They also have two jet skis in station, which are called Watercraft 85 and Watercraft 285. Uh, they had zero responses for the month of August, which is surprising. Total for that station, 69 total uh, responses. Combined between the two stations, 190 total calls for service 
2019 and August of 2024 for both stations in Laughlin. Uh, there was a significant fire. <coughs> uh, the press release that I have on that fire says it was 60 acres. I don't necessarily know that it was that big. 63 acre fire along the Colorado River between Laughlin and Bullhead City. Large brush, brush fire created smoke that could be seen for miles, but due to favorable winds, did not threaten any structures. The fire was quickly brought under control with the assistance of helicopter drops from nearby Arizona BLM Aviation Resources. Crews worked to create a perimeter around the fire and is contained while still smoldering. This is press release from that day. While still smoldering on the interior fire footprint, fire crews will remain on scene overnight to ensure that no hot spots flare up, although the fire may continue to produce smoke. Fire response utilized interagency coordination and cooperation from all agencies in all, Clark County responded with four engines, three water tenders, one rescue, two chief officers. Bullhead City supplied two engines. The National Park Service responded one engine and one chief officer. United States Forest Service responded with one engine and BLM responded two engines and a helicopter. Uh, at this time, I'm prepared to take any questions and answer uh, <coughs> any concerns. Was advised that maybe there'd be some questions or comments concerning this fire, no? Okay. Well, that's all I have for you. Any questions? Nope. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> okay, we will receive a report from Jason Bailey, Big Bend Water. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Jason Bailey, Big Bend Water District with our monthly report. Uh, for water use, total August diversions were 314 acre feet, up slightly from August of last year. Total year to date diversions uh, are 2,079 acre feet. Uh, again, a, a little bit of a bump from uh, year to date last year. A water system update, um, staff has, has cleaned and uh, performed some maintenance on the river intake. Uh, to help prevent clogging and, and restriction uh, of the water to the treatment facility. That was performed a couple weeks ago and then, and then again today with, with the river flows uh, lowered. So that's uh, pretty routine maintenance to help uh, clean out those intakes. And then also just a, a note for the system update that some replacement chemical feed pumps for the treatment plant and distribution system have been ordered and will re be replaced uh, soon. And that's just an instrument uh, that helps kind of accurately uh, pump out chemicals um, for uh, consistent dosing of those. Uh, development inquiries, you can see that, uh, below no new updates on development inquiries uh, since last month. And then the financial update for the fiscal year to date through July 31st, the Big Bend Water District had an operating surplus of 191000 and then after including capital expenditures, debt service payments, and SRF funding, the accumulated debt balance decreased $585,000 from fiscal year end of 2024. Um, that decrease was primarily due to receiving a, a number of grant receipts for SRF funding. So the state grant- State revolving fund. Yes, okay. yep, state revolving fund, yes. So that's the, the decrease there you see. Um, and then just an update on the word of funding and, and just other uh, means of funding. Again, the, the Big Bend Water District Storage Project remains on the state revolving fund priority list. And now both the House and the Senate have passed their versions of the Water Resources Development Act funding. WERDA. So, WERDA, yes. So this, uh, the conference committee process now begins. So they've both uh, approved their versions and now the committee between the both uh, that that begins and that is and, and I know uh, Miss Fisher had a few questions for item number two and I recommend that we hold those until that item if that's okay yes sure madam chair I do have a couple of questions or, or just yes. clarification for the public um, because the public may not be aware Jason um, you and I have been going back and forth and and I'm going into some of the original agreements um, some of the constituents some are present in this room today have reached out to me regarding the status of lift station two. now I do realize that this should probably come under will but 
I'm looking into the interlocal agreement, um, and I've forwarded, so that the public is aware, I've forwarded, um, and we're researching the documents for the lift station two maintenance. Now this is from December 2nd of 2008, and for the public, if they're not aware, uh, Public Works um, was my committee that I had um, up until they pretty much took committees away from us. Um, and after that, I believe Fred had uh, the Public Works. So it was something I was involved with. Um, there is the uh, maintenance agreement to lift station two, which was a uh, contract with Brown Caldwell, uh, and a PDF document that we weren't able to locate at this point. And then there is also the, uh, as of the 12 to 2008 minutes of the 2013 proposed collection system CIP project packaging that was completed with the Big Bend Water District before it became Las Vegas Valley Water District. And I've just had some inquiries pertaining to lift station number two, its current status, what has happened, and you know some concerns regarding the status of it today that I've forwarded to you and, and hopefully we'll get those documents. It's just they're quite old from 2008, so that'll give us some idea. Yep, thank you. Yeah, we're working with the county since those are on their archived uh, website. We're working with the county and trying to locate those documents, I, so thank you. So I just wanted the public to be aware because some of the people that had made inquiries about Lift Station 2 are here today. Okay. So just let them know that I've indeed been in contact with you. We're trying to research that. Yeah, and I've been in contact with the county as well to try to receive Great. those. Thank, so thank you. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Will Smith was not able to make it with us today, but his report will be in the back of the room. That is for the water reclamation. Okay, we'll receive a report from Maria O'Brien with health. Nope, not here today. Okay, let's receive a report from Kelly Lohr, Southern Clark County Coordinator for with UNR Extension. Hello, Kelly Lair, UNR Extension. We began a Tuesday afternoon garden class geared toward homeschool kids today at the library. It began at 1.30, same time as this uh, meeting, and it's called Healthy Happy Herbs. It's focusing on growing, eating, and utilizing herbs. Um, she had it a, a full house today. Yeah, she um, was she was hauling everything in when I was. stopped by yep, at the library she was to return some books, and she's got these big carts and yep. it's hauling those little plants in. So, and <laughs> this is this is going to be offered every Tuesday from one thirty to two thirty uh, through the month of October. So Devin's also use a lot, utilizing. She's my uh, my instructor, my community based instructor, and she's using the Laughlin uh, Master Gardeners for their expertise as well during that class. We will be working 4-H into the second grade science curriculum uh, at Bennett Elementary beginning Thursday at 9 a.m. So all three second grade teachers are going to get steaming through the seasons. Um, it's a curriculum focusing on earth and environmental science. And it begins with a fun one called Appalicious. So it goes with the different seasons. So we'll go from apples and we'll go to pumpkins and through the holidays. So the curriculum will be every Thursday morning. It goes through December 12th. And then also on Thursday, we do 4-H um, programming at the Boys and Girls Club. And they really wanted baking and decorating. So we're going to have all kinds of uh, good treats on Thursdays, right? So we go from herbs and healthy eating to treats and decorating. Um, Devin is also offering an outdoor Nevada program, which begins September 16th, which is this coming Monday, from 10 to 2. And the group's first field trip is exploring Christmas Tree Pass. And the premise behind the workshops are to explore local hiking trails. Some of the kids have never been outside or even know that some of the petroglyphs and, and the history behind some of the lands. So she's taking them to discover plants and animals and expose them to some local history in a group setting. And it's engaging the kids during teacher in-service days. So they'll still be getting out and getting some, some um, group interaction, some teamwork. And then, of course, pre-registration because she wants to make sure she has enough adults for each kid. She wants to do about one adult to every five kids. Uh, we continue to prepare for National Public Lands Day at Pyramid Canyon. Um, we are partnering with National Park Service to do the seed ball table. 
We're excited about that, and that's ultimately to help the butterfly population flourish and provide native pollinators to the parks in the, the neighborhoods of Laughlin. And we'll also be participating in National Night Out and Trunk or Treat. So that's what I have for you all. Are there any questions for us? Any questions? No? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we see a report from Parks and Rec. Not here. Okay, let's move on to receive a report from Carrie L Larson, the Laughlin Chamber. Good afternoon, board. Carrie Larson, Laughlin Chamber of Commerce. I have shot out the gate today running like a 200 yard meter dash. <laughs> I'm from that weird generation where it was part one and then part the other. Um, we have a whole bunch going on at the chamber. We have a ribbon cutting and groundbreaking for uh, Resilient Minds. This is a mental health um, organization, well, company. She's come to town and reached out to the chamber to help get off the ground. So that's happening September 13th at 9 a.m., which I think is Friday the 13th, this Friday. Um, we also have a vo Voodoo Cove, the new restaurant where Covu was. So we went there last weekend for their grand opening as a team, and it was delicious. We got them signed up right away. We're going to do a ribbon cutting on October 4th for them. The time is to be determined. Um, networking and education at the chamber tonight, we have Toastmasters at 5 o'clock. That is always the second and fourth Tuesday. So this month it will be today, September 10th, and the 24th. Yesterday, we had a Mindset Mastery class. It was the first in a three-part series um, put out by Tina Jett, and she's a life coach. And I got to tell you, it was some fantastic information um, about grounding yourself and, and just, you know, when you're overwhelmed, how do you get yourself to sleep when you're borrowing trouble at night, worrying about things? All kinds of different information. So we will have another one coming up with her um, September 16th. That'll be Conscious Communication. And then September 23rd will be Cultivating Your Creative Edge. All of those are at noon and lunch is included. Please RSVP to the chamber. Our business breakfast this month is September 27th at 8.30 a.m. This time it'll be Sanford Cohen with Jack FM talking about common mistakes, common marketing mistakes, turning strangers into customers and stimulating commerce. Those are always a big hit and it is a packed house. So again, please RSVP before you come. Our round table, October 7th at noon, will be on building a stronger tourism industry with Meg McDaniel from LVCDA. She is a wealth of knowledge, so we encourage you to come if you're interested in tourism or expanding our tourism in this community. That is also at noon, and lunch is included. And we found if we give food, they come. So it works out great. <laughs> Um, another new thing that we're doing, we are starting chamber field trips because everybody loves a field trip. Uh, so the first one that we will have will be a small group, maximum of 20, and we will go tour the DOT facility um, and learn what the DOT food distribution company is all about. We're also going to be going to the Catholic Charities Campus um, IFP, our Laughlin Bullhead International Airport, and Warm Sea. Those dates will be released in the future, but we're planning to do one of those a month. They are very exclusive tours, so kind of like a shore excursion. You want to make sure you sign up before all the spaces are taken, so please RSVP to the Chamber. As far as Chamber of Commerce events, we are having the Progressive Happy Hour hosted by Laughlin River Lodge. On September 26th, it's really at happy hour time, 4 to 6 p.m. So that'll be $12. Come on down. You can um, get your tickets at the chamber or on site for that one. National Night Out, that's a big deal. Michelle at the chamber has been facilitating that October 9th at 5 p.m. So we are happy to help out with our first responders on that. October 11th at 6 o'clock. Roadhouse Roundup. We're going to go honky tonk in Searchlight, courtesy of a round trip bus ride from Silver Rider. So the bus will load at 6 p.m. It is a total of $10. 
Eight of that goes to Silver Rider for their bus transport fee. The remainder after our um, credit card fees are taken out will be donated to Southern Nevada Transit Coalition's Megan Jackson toy drive. So instead of a tip for the driver, it'll be going to their toy drive. So come on out. We have a maximum of 68 people that can go. The 27th Annual Community Achievement Awards, that's November 2nd at 4.30 p.m. Um, we just had a wonderful meeting talking about who we were going to be selecting for our final four. So that process is ongoing, and I've been rather impressed with our panel of judges this year. They're quite spectacular. Well, I don't have anything to compare it to, but they were awesome. <laughs> and then uh, last chamber event will be Tinsel and Tunes with the Killer Dueling Pianos. That'll be December 10th at 5 p.m., so it is dinner and a two and a half hour show for only $50 a person. There will be VIP tables that will be seated up front that will be for purchase. So you can contact the chamber. Hey, if your business doesn't want to throw its own Christmas party, come party with the chamber at their Christmas bash. Membership, our quarter th three results. So we have had 13 new members this quarter, eight since last month's report, three of which are from Laughlin. Our total members is now at 330. Percentage from Laughlin is 32%. And I got it, okay, I got a brag. I was told if you don't, nobody else will. So in the history of our electronic records for the chamber, they date back 10 years. The most new members the Laughlin Chamber team ever brought in for a single year was 47. This week we have totaled out 65 for the year this year alone. So I want to congratulate my team. They're doing a spectacular job. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate all of your support, and it's going swimmingly. So if you would like to be one of our new members to close out the year, the banner record year, you will get $500 in credit for radio advertising at Murphy Broadcasting. Um, our VIPs, their next event will be Jason Aldean on September 21st. Um, they are having their general meeting tonight, so if you are interested in joining the Volunteers in Partnership, call the chamber real fast and maybe you can make it there tonight to see what it's all about. Um, and then as far as the rest of the report, since all the busyness was along, I'm just going to let it ride on the paperwork here. Uh, there have been no changes, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. I always forget that part. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Do we have Jackie Walland with us? No, she didn't make it. Hmm? No, Tanya. Okay, announcements of upcoming neighborhood <coughs> meetings in county from the county and the community meetings. None at this time, minus what we talked about. <laughs> okay, we have no planning and zoning, and we'll move on to general business. Here we go. Receive a report from Nevada by design regarding the Laughlin Water Storage Tank Development Project proposal to Big Bend Water District. <clears throat> Good afternoon, members of the board, members of the community. Thank you all for giving us this opportunity to actually come here and introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Evan Needham. I'm here with uh, Dr. Houston Pullen as well, who will also come up here in a minute to give his report. And we are the executive directors of World Economic Support Agency. So that is our nonprofit NGO, which we have stood up with a program called Nevada by Design, in which you guys have probably seen on the reports. Um, as you'll see on some of the handouts that we have in the back and, and in front of you, our main mission here, you know, verbatim is what you'll see, is to foster sustainable community and economic development initiatives that empower individuals, strengthen the communities, and drive long-term prosperity, which also puts the pen back in the hand of the community members. But in simple terms, what it really means is coming here with an open ear 
and actually listening to the members of this community and understanding what the needs and desires actually are. And oftentimes, a uh, clear communication is the most effective way for us to be able to have everybody at the table to be able to, to uh, deliver more of a five to 10 year vision for this community. And that's when we can start to have the conversations about the, the real needs of this community, whether it's be, be hospitals or um, being active duty in the Marine Corps for eight years. I, my heart goes out to a lot of veterans. There's a lot of veterans in this community and there's not enough resources for our veterans either. So these are all initiatives that fall under our mission and our purpose. And that is truly what we're here to do, is to also help us with this economic uh, stagnation that we are being placed upon in this community. And it's, it's, it's not one representative's responsibility to do that. It is everybody's job to come together collaboratively, sit down at the table and come up with an, a long-term plan and vision for us to make these initiatives happen. And so there's a lot of conversation about economic development and so forth, but what it really comes down to is, in simple terms, our main focus here has been where can we start? Whenever you come across any type of infrastructure enhancements or upgrades that need to be done, you don't want to look at the whole picture. There's no way to come at this and just chop this whole tree down at one swing. What you have to do is you have to look at the incremental steps that we can take and achieve at our level so we can start knocking down the procedures that need to take place for us to meet our long-term goals so that way we can actually see type, some type of growth and prosperity in this community in which everybody has been asking for. And so that, that's kind of our whole scope of approach. And so we've been very fortunate to work with Jason Bailey, his team with the Water District, um, a lot of the other agencies with the LEDC and other developers in this community and so forth that have been exceptional as far as giving us the, the history of it. My family uh, has been investing in this area for 20 years. Um, I'm a resident myself of Laughlin, so I, I understand what needs to be done here. And the thing about it is, is I, I understand the beauty that this community has and what the potential is. And when you talk to people about Laughlin, it seems to be this unknown or, or it's, not, it's not really on the map. And it's, it's unfortunate because what we have here is truly beautiful. And there's so many people that want to come here with their businesses. They want to bring their family members, their children. They want to come to the schools here. And it just seems to be this topic of conversation that it's, it's, we're having too many infrastructure issues. We're not moving forward. So then where do you start? Well, our job for World Economic Support Agency is to come in and be that advocate to kind of create that template for us to have the conversations. If you look at any type of strategic planning, especially in the military, the very first thing you want to do for a successful operation is bring all of your leadership command to the table, right? So that's representatives of their specific specialty. Now, we're not here to say that we're the, the experts of any type of conversation or narrative, but our job is to bring the experts from every department and division or municipality and, and so forth to have them give their report and their, their um their, their report to us so that way we can go out and do our best interest to turn over every rock. And that's what we do. We bring here our connections, we bring here our mindset, and more importantly, we're here to turn over all of the rocks. And any time you want to stop and look at one option that's on the table, that's, that's beneficial, but it's not always the best interest because there may be a small rock that somebody failed to overturn, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to turn over every rock to make sure that we have the most informed decision possible that we can lay on the table so that everybody that has some type of critical element in decision making can look at those and make the most strategic and informed decision. We're not here to try to persuade any decision one way or the other. Our, our goal here is to allow everybody to have, like I said in the beginning, put the pen back in the community, listen to the community and see what the desires and the needs are so that way we can start moving in the direction that it needs to go. Um, I have a couple bullet points here because there's just too many things for me to want to discuss, but one of the topics that I also want to mention was the fact of it being more of a planned community. When you look at other communities that, that are not being, they're not being driven with an intent for growth, then nobody's really guiding the vessel, especially not the community members. And that's the most important thing here is allowing them to have a voice by them having that pen. And so our goal is to try to create more of a planned vision by being an advocate and creating those conversations. And Houston will come up here in a second and he'll be able to discuss more of his approach on his connections and uh, the funding sources that I know a lot of people are interested in. But our main intent here is to just deliver as much, to be an, an asset to this community to our best of ability, <laughs> listen to what the needs are and listen to every representative and get the details on the table and then provide that so that the community can make that decision. That's what we're truthfully here for. 
Um, so with that said, I will bring Dr. Houston Pullen up to the table and he will be able to give his report on our grant funding. Thanks, Evan. Thanks so much and it's a pleasure to see uh, all the board members again. How are you? It's good to see you. Uh, I am Dr. Houston Pullen. I'm the uh, co-executive director of WISA and uh, it's a pleasure to stand before you. And as Evan was saying, you know, there's, there's so many things that we could get into with regards to communities and what their needs are. And I'll just give you a little bit of history and back up a minute. Last year, I had the opportunity to talk with several uh, federal entities, specifically the USDA, and really getting a chance to know them and talk to them. And one of the things that they kept bringing up was the fact that there are all these projects, but they've been having such a hard time coordinating to actually see funds from the federal government get down to actually getting projects underway. So that's where this kind of challenge was presented, this opportunity at the same time. And you know, being kind of entrepreneurial mindset oriented as a business faculty uh, that I am, you know, started looking at it and assessing, well, what could we do to actually change that? So, you know, in working and collaborating with the USDA, the birth of this NGO was created and really identifying needs in communities. So, for example, there's a hospital that's being built in Tonopah that they need uh, some solutions on. So we're actually working with them on uh, helping how we can coordinate you know, with our agency to help bring the federal funds in and actually get projects going. In this community, looking at some of the water infrastructure issues that exist, and I have to say, in talking with um, the water district, and they've been fantastic about providing information and being consistent with helping us to understand from their perspective, as well as the community perspective, of what those challenges are with funding, with project management, all of those key areas. And you know, when we started looking at the funding sources, it's not just about federal funding. It's also about, as an NGO, looking at what other sources of funding there are, such as community, uh, community foundation funds that we can actually pull from as an NGO and use towards supplementing projects and taking the lead in helping to develop projects and give them back to the community put the money into the community, into the projects that are needed. So actually, uh, earlier, had a, I was messaging with the USDA because we have a list of grant opportunities and funding sources that I've brought in, that they've brought in, that we're currently vetting right now for the process of which is gonna be the best you know, solution funding-wise for, for, let's say, the water project. Oh, sorry, water projects here in Laughlin. You know, and part of that is really making sure, one, that it's something that's not going to be encumbered on the ratepayers, on the taxpayers. We, that is not uh, what we would want to do, right? We want to make sure we find a solution that's actually going to work. So that means grants, that means foundation dollars, something that's not going to be in the form of a loan, right? And that's really important because, you know, and I think uh, the uh, young lady back there who when we walked in, I heard her talking about, you know, uh, loans and this, that, and the other, that's something that we're, we're not in the business of. We want to make sure that we find opportunities to really support communities because th there are communities across even this state that if you even introduce the idea of a loan, it, that it would never even work. So we really have been very fortunate in working with, like I said, the water district and talking with Clark County and the support that we've been able to garner, the, you know, just uh, dialogue that we've been able to get to is really about getting down to one thing, and I actually think, Doa, you said it best when we met not long ago, was like, what are the needs of the public? What are the needs of the community? <clears throat> Economic development aside, development aside, all of that aside, there is, you know, in this community, we'll take the water project, there's four million gallons that you're in a deficit on. And that, for fire suppression, I mean, the water district is doing everything that it can to find solutions, and so is the county to try and address this, and that's where we want to come in and help support and make sure that we're being a resource and helping to guide, you know, how can we navigate this a little bit more and make sure that we're, you know, supporting them, supporting the community and getting a project done. Because that's one of the things that we're really, really stressing on this, especially with our federal funding partners and all of our partners, is let's just get it done. That's kind of our, you know, in a nutshell, our goal. But I'll turn it over to you. Well said. And, and to caveat off that is it's very important for everybody to understand that with when it comes to development it should not be on the current residents to make that decision to pay for that development absolutely not 
And if we want development to be able to stand on its own and pay for further development, we have to get to a point to where this community is back up on its feet and self-sustaining itself, meaning when we can get out of this deficit, we can get to the water district to be able to have a position to where new development can come in and bring those funds to pay for further advancement of the infrastructure, that is when you have development paying for development, and that's the ultimate goal here. We need to get to a point to where this community is organically growing on its own, and that's our intention, and that's, that's our five-year plan in, in a nutshell to kind of drive it to that, that direction. Um, just to, to leave it on the note here is, you know, when it comes to addressing the, this community, and it's not just this community, it's so many other communities, it's very important to understand that when you look into the past, yes, it's important to remember what's happened historically to make sure that we're navigating the correct way. And though you don't want to make a full U-turn as a community, you may want to steer to the left or the right just a little bit and start to navigate on a different path. And usually that's when you start to find a little bit of prosperity and hope. And sometimes, and it's like I said, when you turn over the right rock, you may find your solution. And so what I ask is that we, we really come together to make sure that we're not spreading the word of our, of our infrastructure demands in a negative manner, but in a way that we have a vision, we have hope, and this community is growing. Because that is how we're going to bring businesses, that's how we're going to bring more families, that's how we're going to advance our school system, that's how we get this community to be back up on its feet and put that power back in the community members' hands. And I'll, I'll end it at this, is that, you know, uh, a mentor of mine who's in this room, he told me a very, very important topic to me that I took, especially transitioning out of the military, and it's, you know, in order to have fulfillment in the life, you have to have the six human needs, which is love, growth, significance, variety, contribution, and certainty. And it is our job as a community to deliver that to our community members that they have fulfillment. Right now, they don't necessarily have the certainty. They might not have the growth, but it's our job to bring that, the growth, the variety, and the certainty that they will have a community and we have their back and we're going to help deliver them to where they need to have their fulfillment in life. And so with that said, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. We are open to any questions, but we, we truly appreciate you allowing us to introduce ourselves. Madam Chair. Go ahead. I just, um, just one thing to clarify, um, where Patricia had asked, where you, Ms. Fisher, had asked about turning over every proverbial rock. I, I just want to help the, the board know and the public know that the USDA, and you gentlemen can confirm this because I, I know you're well versed in it, the US Department of Agriculture, a lot of the funding, the water district with the county cannot go after. The only way that funding can happen is through an NGO into a rural area. So it's not necessarily that the water district didn't look at this, but they are not an NGO. Um, and they're not able to pick up that funding or be able to be funded. So that's where an NGO type of organization would be able to access those funds and the county and the water district DOAs here as well cannot. I've spent a lot of time with USDA learning the ins and outs and it was readily apparent to me, um, Eli is not here today, but several of the, the directors at the state level I've spoken with also at the meeting that Susie Lee had here that they cannot do that type of funding and grants to the county. Um, it has to be through an NGO, same way as the hospital in Boulder City was built. So it's not that they didn't look at that, but that's not an option for them. So I just wanted the board to know that as well. And I think to just to piggyback off of that, and thank you for that, is that's part of what this NGO was established to be, right? To talk about how we can come in and help projects and actually get those kinds of funds into things that and get them working. That's really what the mission is. And that's why, you know, like I said, the Water District has been fantastic to talk with and work with over the last several months and just getting a, an understanding and, you know, providing regular updates both ways. And I think that that's really helpful um, as we get through this is there are dollars available, not even from a federal aspect. There are private foundation dollars, like I'd mentioned before, that we're looking at as well that are, you know, once we have, you know, agreements in place and whatnot to be able to pursue, we want to be able to, you know, go after them. The preliminary discussions have already been taking place to kind of help set the stage. But I think the other part is oftentimes what we also find, especially with these types of projects, is, you know, government and NGOs, they can sometimes approach projects differently. And what we want to do is we want to be able to coordinate any of the projects that we do to make sure that we're in lockstep 
with all sides, with the community, government, really kind of providing a puzzle piece that's missing sometimes, not just from a funding standpoint, but from a logistics standpoint, and being as transparent as possible in that process to make sure that as a, if a project is underway, we're providing regular transparent updates every single way that's showing people where the money's going, how it's being spent, and making sure that, my goodness, I'm sorry, but making sure that we are on the, we are on the uh, path that we have set out to be on as an agreement with not just our funders, but the community that we're serving as well. So hopefully that helps provide some clarity to that as well. So if we go forward with this, in this direction, do you have money available right now? And what would the timeline be for taking on to the agreement to doing the project? So in terms of grant dollars right now, there's nothing that we have secured. What we have with USDA is we have them identified. What we need in terms of being able to move this forward is we need to make sure that we have support. We have the agreements in place and actually speaking with um, our federal uh, partners as well, as well as our congressional partners, you know, we have support from that level to be able to go after and uh, acquire this. It's also making sure that we have formal agreements in place with like the um, water district and making sure that the county, we have every which way covered to be able to move this forward. And I didn't know if you wanted to yeah, jump in on that. And Full transparency is what we stand for, right? And to answer your question directly, we started this program ab around January after extensive, it's been over almost coming up on two years now of, of navigating all of the options that are on the table for this water tank, whether it's through private development, through the word of funding, which we were able to uh, navigate with Susie Lee in January. There's been so many different moving parts, so understanding it has been the forefront. So once January came, that is where we understood the need and desire for a, an NGO like this. And so that's when we decided to start navigating down this route. So we formed in June officially with our attorney, and so all of our documents are pending. We put an expedited request in based on the basis of the needs of this community, based off of fire suppression abilities after we saw the fire that took place, um, public health exactly, and being able to take down the system for repairs, as, as we all know is a major component here without having to shut down the system. That's the needs for these, these, this deficit for us to be resolved. So we put in that expedited request and that was approved. So we are waiting currently any moment for our status to be approved. So right now we do not have our status. That is the only impending part on us. And we weren't necessarily under the impression that time was, we've been dealing with this for many years. So time has not been necessarily a concern until other options have been put on the table, which is totally fine. And it needs to be, every option needs to be put on the table. But we stand where we stand and we can't rush it, we can't do anything, but we do have congressional members that are aiding in support in any way they can with letters of support and so forth to try to get us there. But we are pending our status any, any month now. And then once that comes in, we have done the preliminary. Day at this point. Yeah, we've done the preliminary uh, grant writing yep. as well so that we're, we're moving within the idle period. So that way, as soon as that gets approved, our accounts are open, we can uh, then apply for the grant. And status is 501c3 nonprofit, am I correct? From the federal government as a tax exempt yes, charity. Yes, and that's that's what you mean by status correct okay and so you have support from the federal level down but you don't have any support for your NGO to go after these issues from the town board and the county level to support you in your endeavor you have it from the federal down right. but not from the town board county right and and you know to piggyback off of both of these points you know the one piece you know in following our attorney's guidance and making sure that we're doing what we're supposed to you know, we are allowed to start talking and having discussions with potential funders and donors, and we've already started that because we are allowed to do that. We cannot take those funds until that status is in place, which is any day at this juncture. We want to. But, and then also getting that support is also very helpful because it's one thing to get letters of support from federal delegations and this, that, and the other, but it's also making sure that the community that we're in and that we're working with, we have a support there as well. Because it's not just about water, too. You look at the water project, but there's other needs of this community that are also evident. And I've had this discussion with USDA. There's healthcare needs. There's all kinds of things that are really needed here to be able to support what's here. Not looking at future development, but looking at the needs right now. And that's really important for I think everybody to understand that there's critical needs that are needed in this community, much like the other communities that we're working with as well. And I'll add one more. Sure. 
topic to this is it, it, to provide all the details. We have already reached out to tank developers and we have gotten our proposals back. Um, and so what we are going for is enough grants to supply for both storage tanks. Our goal here is to get the community out of the deficit, not just go for one tank. Um, obviously our numbers are, are bare bones and it, to give you, it would have to be more of a conservative route, but we do have those, uh, the numbers, we, prov we brought them here if anybody would like to see those as well so we have full transparency. Was that part of what I gave this board in the last meeting, I think? No, uh, it no, was no. a this proposal. Is, this so is these the, are the hard numbers. Yeah, this is the okay. hard numbers that you guys can see for yeah, transparency I think definitely what we've been receiving. Like yeah. um, obviously, when it comes to any project, you know, and this goes back to with the water district, everything has to be um, estimated with at least a 20 to 30 percent margin of increased funds because anything can go wrong during a project, especially when there's a lot of unknown variables still because it's been many years since anybody's navigated tank construction. So. Our numbers are very, are very small, but we're getting them from a NGO level, not from viewed as, as, a, as a government and municipality. So to credit to where it's due, there's, there's reasoning behind the difference in the numbers of the proposal, but it is important for us to understand that you need to set aside an extra set of funds for any type of changes that may come place. Contingency of 20% on, so Absolutely. if I remember my numbers correctly, 5.5 million and a, an additional 20% on that. Absolutely. What you're saying is a yes. contingency, and that's standard, I do that in my construction and as well. And with all the conversations we've held with all of our uh, possible grant funds and everything, it, it, it doesn't seem to be any type of constraint or issue going after that. Obviously, there's more issues we need to address here, but this is just the first step. And then from there, we're also looking at the SID. We have, you know, as I call him a pioneer, like Robert Bilbray here has been the biggest advocate in getting us that detailed information. That is what we need. We need more community members like that to give us that information so that we can go and do our part and bring those resources down, get that known and get those funds brought to this community so we can start chipping away further. These tanks are just the unlocking key, but they're not the critical element here of discussion. We need to get through this so that way we can move forward. But we, we have to be careful in how we proceed because it is very important that we do not end up having the same conversation in one to two years from today. Because if we do not navigate accordingly with a strategic plan on how to bring in the funds, and time is usually the concern here, but if we want to sacrifice a little bit more time to have a, a little bit of a structured plan of attack that will put us in a better position with two tanks and then not be having this conversation, in one to two years when that tank capacity is maxed out with entitlements, that's something that needs to be taken into account. And that's, that's part of the conversation. We're not saying that's the option, but it's part of the conversation because our intention, again, to the basis of it, is to get this community out of the deficit, get the water district to a point to where new development can pay for further advancement of development infrastructure. And that is how you have the community organically growing itself. And that's what our mission is. Sorry. <laughs> so, Madam Chair, if I could ask the gentleman, because I think this is of concern to this, this board as well, and, and definitely the constituency, your historical ties to Laughlin, your backgrounds, um, I, I, I don't know if any of the other, I'm aware of it, but I don't know if any of the other members are in the community. And then additionally, um, you know, the presentation, or not the presentation, but the proposal that you have for the building of the water tanks, um, and then the funding that you've been able to identify if you can get us some information on that, that Absolutely. would be appreciated. Absolutely. So if you'll give us your backgrounds. <laughs> yeah, sure, I would love to. Um, not to go into too much detail, but I served eight years active duty in the Marine Corps, um, multiple combat deployments, and then I moved into, one, in my, again, my family's been here for 20 plus years. Uh, they are operating at the Laughlin Bay Marina development, and so I have a organic, um, heartfelt, longing to this community. I'm a resident of Laughlin, so for me, this community is everything to me as well, which is why we're using this as our, our pilot program, as you would say, to truly generate our long-term success for our organization, because we know we have the capabilities, the connections, and we know the people here, and to us, it's actually meaningful. It gives us the fulfillment to be here and be an asset to this community. Um, so with that, so we are working, I, I have a little bit of development experience, but again, my expertise 
is not coming here as a developer. My, my expertise is coming here as a leader in combative territories and so forth and understanding organizational structure, understanding what it takes to get a mission accomplished and bring everybody to the table that needs to be addressed and brought to that table so that way we can have operational oversight and make sure that this is planned effectively and we have or, or, uh, operational success. That's my intention here. And so that's a little bit about my background. I'll turn it over to Dr. Houston Fulton. Yeah, and uh, as for my background, I have a, a pretty interesting one. Um, <laughs> I have a background in, that spans multiple different types of industries and sectors with regards to economic development, community development, workforce development, in addition to public affairs, communication, strategic communications, and leading different programs for the federal government, for contractors, for private entities, and even as my own uh, small business uh, uh, a number of times over. And I'm actually, uh, as you said, I have my doctorate in business administration. And actually, the interesting part about that is um, it's actually on entrepreneurial education and training programs impact on developing nations' entrepreneurial output, but I also converted it to rural development and looked at it from the lens of infrastructure and how infrastructure can support economic growth in addition to public health initiatives within specific areas and how that fosters more entrepreneurial endeavors. And I see Carrie Larson from the chamber here. And you know, when you're looking at the business community and you need it to be a thriving you know, ecosystem that can actually survive, it needs certain, it, it needs to have certain needs there. So that's been a lot of the research that I've done and application that I've done to the work that I've been able to do as a faculty member and also as a practitioner. So, yeah. Thank you. Now it's your, yep. So, assuming you get your um, 5013C approved, what is the actual time plan, the time frame for getting the funding to start work on the water tank? So that's, and I think that that's uh, a really important question here because once that's approved, like I said, we've already started having discussions and grant proposals have already been written. Like it's a matter of making sure that we're following what we're supposed to in this process because it's a startup, right? Entrepreneurial endeavor and making sure that it's something that's not just gonna support this community, but it's supporting the other communities in which we are being brought in to help support projects there as well. But we want to make sure that any of the proposals that we have have the support behind them and have everything needed. And obviously, if it's going to private foundations, their timelines are different from federal entities and certain federal entities are different from others. But what I, and I think Evan can probably speak to this a little bit with regards to the, the actual build time, is once we get enough upfront capital to get this going through grants or whatever mechanism it is that we're going to utilize for getting the initial development rolling, um, our developer, I think, is ready to go as soon as January? Yeah. Yeah, you wanna. So when it comes to any type of development project, what you're going to go for is the first 30 percent, and the first 30 percent is going to be your design preliminary review, right? And so that is what we have already, we met with the water district and their design team. We had our tank developer on the call, and we tried to get a realistic number because my tank developer says if I can get in by November with funds, I can be going vertical by January. The, the, the report we got back was that's a little bit tight on time and a little rushed. So I asked for a meeting to have everybody just, like I said before, bring everybody to the table and have an, an, an educated discussion on this. And so it can be anywhere from three months to six months when it comes to using the, the consultants from the water districts represent, re representative from their sector um, to do the preliminary design and review. Now that is something we are open to fund if they want to use an in-house program. Um, we also have our tank developer willing to do it as well, and that's covered under that 5.3 for two tanks with prevailing wages included. Um, and that's very important to understand as well. So when it comes to the design and build time, it could be anywhere from three to six months for the design time, and then build time is, I'll, I'll leave that for uh, a more detailed answer from our tank developer, but it is typically in the, in the realm from you know, a year to two years. But when you're doing this on a private, in, a, in an NGO platform, we can typically get through this a little faster than you will see government agencies have to go through it. That's just the unfortunate nature of government works, but it's nobody's fault to that, it's just how it works. So that's another advantage to using an NGO in that sector. So the timeline with the water district, with the Fort Mojave Development Funds was 18 to 24 months. So do you feel relatively comfortable your timeline would be Absolutely. the same once your status came in? Absolutely. And you feel that's only days away? Correct. And they're willing to do both tanks. They, they have given us and the green And that's two light. tanks instead of one. 
And um, they've given us the green light that they have the time set aside, they are willing to do this. They're coming out of Bakersfield, California, and they do work, they are licensed in Nevada, and they are fully aware of the site, the scope. We've given them the actual scope provided to us that from you Big provided Bend. from the Water District when from you had your meeting with the tank developer, and I believe Doha was on that call, yes, if I'm not mistaken. So we, yeah. yes, we got the scope from Big Ben, and we turned that over to our tank developer for a full review, and so they have given us the full green light that they're ready to go as soon as we have the fund set aside. So we just need, like Houston said, to get the first initial 30%, get the ball rolling. Whether that percent goes to our tank developer or we, we send it over to the Big Ben Water District and we work some type of private relationship development project that way. We're not, opt we're, we have no, you know, preference on how we roll with this. Our goal is to get these tanks built get and get the water district out of this deficit, get no debt on the books and get development paying for development and not be impeding on the local uh, community members because it is not their responsibility to bail us out of this. And another caveat to that, we also cannot decentivize our region for developers to want to come here. So you can't ask developers to pay for this either because it's not necessarily their job and responsibility. Correct. They've paid, you know, enough money holding onto their properties they could have already paid for these tanks. And so the goal here is to not not to put the pressure on them but to create more of an incentivized region like you see across the river where they have tax incentivized zones. So if we don't have that, we can at least try to do our job to bring external resources in, be an advocate to this community, get Big Ben Water District out of this deficit and get them into a position where they have the cards in their hand to then deliver the future infrastructure that's needed. And then we can start having the conversations about Southlands and everywhere else that is truly advantageous for us to discuss. Um, but if that answers the question. I, I would like to just add one more thing. I think that it should everything you know, if we're able to get the support and get the agreement and everything gets going, we would be more than happy to come back with more updated timelines, project-specific timelines in coordination with the water district, tank developer, funders, and make sure that you have a more robust viewpoint of where we're going. Because like we said, you know, this is an initial introduction, just discussion, but if we can work those pieces out, I mean, we'd love to come back and, you know, regularly come back as the project is going so you have updates on a monthly basis of where things are at, how things are going, and give you those milestones that we would set with those sides as well. I, I'd like to ask one more question. I understand there was $3 billion from USDA for these infrastructure um, rural or non-GOs. Are those funds still available? And I'm assuming you're going to be going for those in full force. <laughs> well, I know that there are several, I, I think that is on the list that USDA had sent me. Um, the three billion you're talking about that was uh, appropriated and whatnot. Uh, that I believe is on the list, but um, what, what we would probably wanna do is make sure that we understand every piece of those funding opportunities because oftentimes what we've seen, especially with summer, you know, it could be a grant loan option, Loan is something we are not, right. we're staying away from. We want to focus on grants or donations, which like I said, those foundation dollars are also really important there. So what we would do is we would identify and make sure that we have those funding mechanisms and those, um, those identified. And as part of the plan, then come back and present, here is exactly what we're using, but nothing's off the table, as Evan said. Right. It's more so about making sure that we're doing what's right and in the best interest of the community and the stakeholders that we're working with. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions, sir? Any questions? Madam Chair, did you want to call any public questions of them? Yeah, <laughs> I just didn't know how you wanted to proceed. Okay. Um, now that we don't have any questions left with the board, would anyone from the public like to ask questions? That pertains to this? Robert Bilbray, B-I-L-B-R-A-Y, representing the uh, Laughlin Economic Development Corp. First of all, I'd like to expect my appreciation to uh, Evan and to Kathy for bringing this alternative before us today, especially in light of what the next agenda item is, and uh, it, which, which it definitely will materially impact. The, the timeline is, I think, workable. Um, I'm um, not sure that, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of other alternatives in the short term. Um, I'll, I'll speak on the next agenda item independently, but uh, um, 
I, I feel comfortable with, with the NGO and, and, uh, and the concept, and, and, it, and I think the timeline is workable for this community. Surely it's a far cry better than some of the alternatives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and again, for the 400th time, Rothen Economic Development Corporation has no interest in having existing ratepayers pay for future development. And I think we've been saying that for about 12 years now. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie Larson, private citizen, resident at 3687 West Clift Avenue uh, in Laughlin. Um, I've done some research because, as you know, I had previ previously provided the board some um, bids on tanks. So if you don't mind, I've brought you, and I've also left several copies in the back next to the progressive happy hour at yeah. Laughlin River Lodge <laughs> flyer. Um, I'm going to provide these. You can go ahead and start. Um, okay. So in my, my current job, I had the pleasure of sitting on that round table with Mark for the Small Business Administration. Um, and in my discussions with short. Susie Lee and the is Administrator Guzman, the one thing that I brought out. We're short a copy. We are short? Okay. Um, the one thing that I brought up was that it would be a shame Thank you. to promote small businesses in Laughlin when there is not a large enough population to support them. The last thing you want to do is have small businesses go out and get loans and fail because they don't have enough customers to support them. Laughlin must grow if we are going to have the regular services that communities need. A lot of our residents are not mobile in an automobile to get across the river. We need those things here. And in order to do so, we have to develop. One of the critical, actually the most critical thing um, to present itself for peak development in de developing Cottage Court and Cottage Hill was that we were squeezed by the price of housing across the river versus the cost to build on this side of the river. It's exorbitantly more expensive on the Laughlin side to build. For example, a water hookup fee in Bullhead City is $405. Through Las Vegas Valley Water District, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm going through the current ones, I believe it is $3,391 now versus 405 in speaking to Bronson Mack at the water, um, and I'm going to take longer than three minutes, so I'm sorry. Um, it, he corrected my understanding. The 3391 will have an additional $3,000 on top of it. So just the water permit fee will be $6,391 with the plan to use the Fort Mojave Development Fund money to allow Las Vegas Valley Water District to build the tanks. Um, so I want to make sure that we are not overburdening the cost of construction to build senior housing, to build residential housing, to build affordable housing, because the developers will not come if the market will not sustain a price level required to sell at based on the infrastructure and permitting costs and building code requirement costs. I mean, now we have to put sprinklers in every single resident. And it's about $5,000 more per house, which you don't have to do across the river. So to give you some perspective, I saw Jill Ramlott wrote a article, and it said that the um, engineering contract to get started on the design, they wanted to spend $875,000 for an engineer 
my breath was taken away. And I know that there is a two million gallon welded tank that just completed construction up in the Virgin Valley Water District. That's mesquite. So keep in mind important things. We talked about mobilization being expensive. Well, it is also just as far from Las Vegas as Laughlin is. It's 117 miles to mesquite. We're about 90 miles to Laughlin. So they had all of those mobilization numbers in their cost to build the tank. So how much did Virgin Valley Water District pay an engineer $105,000 versus $875,000. I'm not sure how that happens. So in your materials, I actually scoured through their board agendas and packets to provide you their actual numbers. That number, I adjusted for inflation. BLS claims that there's 6% increase in engineering um, payroll increases from 2022, 2021 to 22, and then 7% from 22 to 23, and I added another 7%. So I adjusted that number up to allow for higher costs for the engineers. I also added an additional 30% in overhead costs to that number. It comes out to about $165,000 if you were to do that same contract today. The difference is 345% more what Las Vegas Valley Water District is presenting as a cost for an engineer. That does not make a lot of sense to me. Their tank, which is that second one that says uh, from Steve Hall, they have three, oh wait, let me back up. The engineer that they hired was Sunrise Engineering. They're in Henderson. They've done work with Las Vegas Valley Water District. So the tank company, the tank contractor that they end up using up in Mesquite, their build out ended up at $3.6 million versus $11 million. It also provides three separate bids and as to why they used bird construction. Bird construction, is in Las Vegas. They had to mobilize all the way up to Mesquite. So I wanted you guys to have these two because they are pertinent to your decision making today. Um, this second, third page from Sunrise Engineering it looks like a big giant graph here. This breaks down every single cost that they put in in building that two million gallon welded tank, which is what's proposed here. 3.6 million versus $11 million. Again, we cannot overburden our developers with pre-development costs because they will not come. The BLM auction did not have giant developers come because there was too many infrastructure costs in front of them. So that loan failed. We're setting ourselves up for another failure by adding what will end up to be $22 million to get us out of our $4 million deficit. And then what, another $11 million to have extra? I understand that part of it is grandfathered in, but the realization is the deficit is there right now as we stand, and um, I hope that this provides you some things to contemplate. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? <clears throat> so, um, Madam Chair, they did have this as an action item. So, you know, it listed as an action item, um, would you entertain a motion for a letter of support for Nevada by Design and uh, World Economic Support Agency uh, on behalf of the residents and Laughlin Town Advisory Board to go forward? into finding solutions for rural infrastructure development and funding as an NGO. Would you entertain a motion for that? Yes. A letter of support? Okay. Yes. I second. We have a motion and a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Okay, motion carried. Thank so you. 
We will move forward with the letter for the NGO. Yeah, we got to vote first. Oh, oh, vote. oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? There we go. Motion carries. Thank you. Would you consider issuing a letter with the commission support on it? Okay. Uh, number two on the general business is to reconsider issuing a letter of support to the board county clerk commissioner supporting a loan from the Fort Mojave Development Fund to the Big Bend Water District for the construction of the water storage tanks. So per the LTL. TAB direction of August 27th meeting. So just to preference that one, so we had the item came at the first August meeting, um, I believe it was August 13th, and then at our second meeting on August 27th, um, the direction from the board was to put this item back on the agenda um, to reconsider it. So this was per the direction of the town board. So this wasn't, um, county wasn't Yeah, in general on public comment, Herm requested it be back on the Correct. Uh, agenda for today. Correct. So it was, we were able to get it back on the agenda in what, one week roughly? Because that notice came out before we left yeah. on holiday. So, yeah. so we've seen that it's relatively easy if we table something to get it back on the agenda. Yeah, for this item it was the direction of the board. So I know we tabled it initially and then I was given the direction to put it back on. So um, this wasn't the county isn't putting this back on. This was per the direction from the town board. So that's it. Um, there won't be a presentation. It's just if the board wants to discuss and it from putting it on the board. They're here to answer questions if the public or yep. the board has it. Great. Yeah, and the, and the water district um, has graciously come again so they can answer any questions as well so okay does the board have any questions on item number two under general business um, I just might ask of uh, Doha and Jason if there have been one of the things in from our last meeting that we had asked is you gave us a presentation and you gave us some relative numbers that were kind of ballpark but no particulars on exactly how you know the amortization schedule how it would be paid back um, what the connection fees were um, we did have a member of the public come in and say I think it equated to 30 to pay for the development would or the tank that you would be doing would equal 36 connections I think on a month a month but I'm not sure and and we had been hoping to get that information from from your offices and I just didn't know if there was any further developments on this or not no what I had represented last month was what we took was again taking the very conservative number assuming worst case scenario 11 million and dividing it by what would be a reasonable amount of connections over the 625 acres within that area. And because, if we recall, all conversations in the past have been who's going to pay for this because the rate payers are not. So unfortunately, it's been the first development that comes along to talk to us. We're saying we need a tank. We need a tank. The next one comes along. We need a tank. Nobody's willing to front that money up. They're all understanding, what if I only pay for my share? So taking that approach, we took the 625 acres of land in this area that, that is developable, assuming some average of six units per acre. Now, some can be more, some can be less. We divided that, so that 11 million, we divided it by all of that, which ended up being, it's, $2,933, so we rounded it to 3,000 for ease of presentation. That's where that $3,000 additional cost fee additional. comes from. Right. That is essentially saying, hi, I'm one gas station, I would like my one connection, I'm paying my one percentage of that tank's share. It's a pro rata share. Instead of the first company coming in going, I have to pay for the whole darn thing. The challenge we have is we don't have that money up front in the Big Bend Water District system. It's never been, it's never been there for us. So we don't have that money up front. Wait, wait, you say it's never been there? The money us? has never been earmarked for tanks. It's been earmarked for other things, including debt repayment, as well as the capital improvement projects that have been prioritized to sustain this company's water system. The tanks, this system has been grandfathered in as it stays today. 
through the NDEP through in NDEP. deficit to allow us to develop within deficit. Correct. Grandfathered in to say the existing base that you have here and the existing storage is fine today, but if we grow and Correct. add more demands to that, it reduces everybody's reliability. And one thing that um, I believe Tammy was gracious enough to make a, another couple of copies for me, um, because I brought and I gave to the members of this board, and, and it perhaps we'll give you, I mean, you I, should yeah, have, have this. Yeah, we have a copy of it, yes. Yeah, and, and this is because, you know, it was brought into question by my commissioner who questioned me as well, stating that there was no surplus when the Big Bend Water District turned over to the Las Vegas Valley Water District. So I was basically put in a position in a position where I had to prove indeed that there was. No, there and was. So, right, there and was. it was almost a, I recalled because again, Public Works was my committee in 2008 when this happened. And it was, I recalled roughly a $10 million surplus. That's I think true. it actually turned out to be 9.7, right. but it placed me in a position where I, in other words, to support what I had said, what my memory and my recollection was, is that indeed there was a surplus. Now, your or the water district chose several, I show, and this has $7.8 million of infrastructure capital improvements that were done. But the tanks at the time when you took over the water district, and I will find those minutes, I'm asking and looking for them now, was a priority when we turned over the water district to you okay. with the $10 million surplus. If it didn't get done, That's we did correct. not control that. Right. But it was a priority, but doing one tank, at, at least as, as It was two tanks with the 10 million. The bids were right. 2 million at the time in 2008. And it would have eaten up that whole amount. And so the decision, because NDP said this community can be grandfathered in as it sits, that you guys have six to 10 hours of storage of water, that you can be grandfathered in as it sits. Anything beyond that would be growth and the, everything we received from this community was that any growth necessary items would be paid for by growth. And so that's why it was prioritized for asking for grant money, but not prioritized amongst the capital improvement dollars that were originally handed over. So that's the backstory on that. So different piles of money. Exactly. And we have never not applied. We've applied, I think there was a question that Patricia Fisher had asked, have we turned over every rock? We have applied for everything that we're allowed to apply for, anything that we could possibly apply for that would not burden the ratepayers to have to be responsible for paying back. And so everything we've gone after, including support for WERDA and everything else, has been for something that would give the money to this community to get us out of this deficit of storage, which would indirectly benefit development by allowing development to come in and not hurt the existing customers that are here. Madam Chair, I want to back up in what you're saying there. Sure. I'd like to know when this community made a decision that that tank was not a priority. It wasn't the community's decision. So when you say you guys made the decision. No, your decision was decision? you don't want ratepayer dollars and you did not want an increase of development connection charges. You wanted development to pay for development. So that was, the, that was understood. Um, but that kind of came after you spent the money on No, 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 that was as we took the system over. I was she here. She says it's a different pile of money. One of them's a pile of money for capital improvements. It's, yeah. it's the world you live in. It's not right. the world we live in, but Understand. it's the world you live in, is that you have money for capital improvements and then you have money that evidently we designated needed to be growth paying for growth and that only the tanks could come from a different set of money. I, I disagree with that entirely, just from the fact that if you, if you run a household and you need to pay rent, that becomes a priority over you know, six other things. And, and I understand the $7.8 million of capital improvements that you did do, but that fund in the little world that we live in, that $10 million excess from rate increases from 2002 to 2006, that surplus we gave you was to get those tanks done. And I will indeed prove that when I find the minutes, okay. that that was your priority and your responsibility to have done back I, then in that time frame. I would appreciate finding that as well too because everything that I have seen has been that we prioritize the things that would create reliability and redundancy within the existing system 
So we, in, we added pressure reducing valves, we added backup generators, we made improvements to the treatment plant, all of the things that we could do to be able to provide water faster and easier and longer as much as possible within the system. Prior to us doing some of those improvements, if one main break happened in one particular zone, everybody in that zone is out of water. Everybody else out of that zone is perfectly fine. Now we have the ability to move water between the zones. What we don't have is enough storage to have longer than six to 10 hours of moving water in the system. So a major main break like what happened in 2018, which cost a lot of money to this very pot of money into this community, we, we were in a situation to have everybody boil water because we didn't have enough storage. And it was a major main break. So these are things that we've gone through to make changes so that we don't have the community who is here today, living here today, running businesses today, and serving tourists today be at risk any worse than they already are. We made improvements to improve it. The storage is something that we want to get done but we understand and agreed with NDP that if development comes in, we need to be making improvements, not hurting your existing storage. And that's why we are at this standstill. So back to the question of where the $3,000 came from, that was a pro rata share for the easiest way of me saying it. Any development that comes along doesn't have to pay the whole amount, they just pay their pro rata share of what they would have triggered. That's where that kind of came from. And if that was, we approve the, the loan approve from it. the Fort Mojave Development Fund. Exactly. So that would be an additional $3,000 to every developer. I do want to answer one of the other questions that uh, Patricia Fisher had asked. One of the questions was, uh, can out-of-date will-serve letters be re, uh, relinquished in favor of the senior housing? And that is against the law. We can't do that. Because water commitment, especially on something that is a residential subdivision, is recorded with the map. We issue a will serve letter. And at the time we sign the will serve letter, we state that we have adequate supply and source and, and capacity to deliver water for fire and domestic needs for that development. Once we've done that, that's necessary and recorded with the map for the state to allow it to be recorded and become a parcel. So even though you may have vacant parcels sitting within the previous developments of Cottage Court or Bilberry Ranch or any of those, those parcels still have a water commitment to them. We can't take it away from them and give it to somebody else. It would be completely illegal on our part, so we can't. I wanted to answer that question on the record. And you just did that for me with one of my residential exactly. locations. We've right. had several, Jason was yes. kind to do that and We've get that We've had several people reach yeah. out just to, to be able Our to Our realtors make, are now requiring that that's before they list a property. And we're happy to provide that so that it is on the record that you have a water commitment, your map has already been recorded, your account of water is already counted in the existing storage tanks. And we're happy to provide those to those existing lots. So question is, so you get the funding from the river fund and as developers come in and they pay their 1% that goes back to the river fund. Yes. What happens when that other 600 acres isn't developed? Those payments or, or money still has to be replaced to the river fund. Oh no, not according to their Is fund. that It'll be a grant. Me, excuse me. I understand your question. Go ahead and Is that going to come back on the members of our community? No because it will be another deficit to us. No, the way that the proposal has been made at the moment is that we, again, can't control the speed of development. Everybody is very hopeful that development would come along, but we can't control that. The loan, I believe it's written right now for up to 30 years. If any portion of it has not been paid back, then that amount doesn't fall on the ratepayers. It just simply becomes a grant. It's an unpaid balance is what it is. Our process in this whole thing, again, this is not an $11 million check that goes from the Fort Mojave funds to the Las Vegas Valley Water District. It is basically like an escrow account. As a bill of any sort comes in, we send it over to the county for payment. 
and essentially the county issues payment out of the Fort Mojave Fund for that piece. If during that time, let's say during the you know, period of time that we're doing engineering design on the tank and site and, and connection, during that time, even if Nevada by Design folks are able to secure some money, whether it be private investment dollars, angel investors, it doesn't matter, it could be WERDA, whatever it is, they get it and they say, I've got this money. Now we turn to them and say, here's an invoice, pay that. We stop taking from Fort Mojave funds. And if, by every stretch of possibility out there, Susie Lee and everybody else is able to make the word of dollars happen, we just stop taking money from Fort Mojave entirely. That's it. Because if we know we have the money coming from some other source, that we're going to take free dollars before we take any Fort Mojave funds first. And it's really, truly up to this community. If we assess a pro rata, pro rata additional charge, if the idea is to say, let's let development slowly be paying for development, if that's the case, it's the choice of this community. Do you want this fee to remain for all future development, or do you want it to go away if we get free dollars? Just understand that if it goes away, that takes care of all of that. But if we need anything else in the future, we don't have a pot that we're generating in this community. And that's entirely the choice of this community, however you want it to look. But this was the proposal, the fastest way to be able to say, how could any development coming in that would triggering this tank be able to pay into it without having to come out of pocket a couple million dollars up front? And the only way we can get a loan, because we can't, we don't have it set up without leaning it against ratepayers. The only way we can get a loan was through the Fort Mojave Fund as of today. Without, like I said, I was here last month and had not heard of the, uh, the proposal by Nevada by Design at that time. So now that we know, if they're able to secure money, we're going to cheer and support them on just as much as you guys are because free money is better, always. And when we had our conversation with the NGO folks, one of the things we talked about, which they were here saying, you got to turn over every rock. One of the things we talked about is, okay, so while they're out pounding the pavement, trying to grab some dollars, whether it be from investors or, or federal dollars, whatever they can get, they're running and trying to grab that. We know we have at least something that we can keep moving against on Fort Mojave dollars. We know we have at least something. And as we get these price quotes in, and thank you very much, uh, Carrie, for bringing up about Sunrise Engineering, I don't control the price that the engineering firms give us. I have zero control over it. I give them a scope of work and they tell me their fee. So I got this fee back and that's it. I'm surely going to ask Sunrise to give me a quote right now and I would love to see what they get. If they come in a lot lower, guess what? We're taking that one. But the thing is, I can't control what the engineers charge. That's what it is. On the contractors, we have to bid this. So I appreciate that you know, Nevada by Design has a tank contractor and they were on the call and I expect them to bid this project. They're going to have the most intimate knowledge of it and hopefully they do come in the lowest, but we are going to bid the project because we have to. This is a public works project. We are a public agency governed by NRS 338. So when this goes out to bid, I am the first person telling you this has got to come in significantly less. We cannot possibly imagine a tank being anywhere near a million, $11 million ever, but we don't know what the bids are gonna be. And so if we get something like what, what Virgin Valley Water District get, I'm dancing. I'm up here dancing in front of you guys because I'm excited about that. I am not expecting to spend $11 million, but I have to be conservative every way stretch of the imagination when we're talking to federal agencies, state agencies, I have to give them the worst case scenario of dollars so that they, pay, they give us what they're expecting. Because there's nothing worse than saying, I need seven million and it comes in at eight and guess what, we're short now and I can't pay a contract. I can't accept or award a contract to a contractor if I don't have the full amount ready to spend. Any other questions? Well, I do like to make a statement. 
back in 08, and Bob, you may remember this, one of the questions that came up at, when we were talking to the builders, and it came up that there was on the capital budget for a five million gallon tank, and it was gonna come out of that $10 million, and that never happened, it just disappeared. I don't understand why. The five million gallon tank was at a totally different location, and it was assumed that that would get us, because we're really, we're deficit of about 4.4 million. So rather than saying a 4.4 million tank, you could say five million gets us there plus padding, right? So if we said one five million gallon tank at say the highest elevation, that still didn't solve the problem that we have in the system. Specifically, I, in, yeah, I, and, I, and I, I, I fully understand that. Yeah. But that information was never provided to the town advisory board. And, and I can, I mean, on behalf of the water agency, I can say I'm sorry that that wasn't you know, explained to you. I know that I've, I've talked with you about it and yeah. explaining that there in the 750 zone, there's a bottleneck. That's really where the problem is. We have one tank. And we can treat so much water at the treatment plant, but that tank acts as what's called a forebay, which is your, your source of water that you pump and push it up. That tank is small, and we can treat a heck of a lot more water. So we can only put water that we've treated into that tank and then pump it up. We need extra storage at that location to almost double our ability to deliver water in this community, which is why it seems strange that we are picking a lower elevation to put the first tank, but that opens up that bottleneck. bottleneck yep. So that's really the first, that gets us three fourths of the way towards compliance by putting the first two million gallon tank there. That's why the five, when we looked at it, said not a good idea, probably two fours. We talked to the NDP and they said two fours are plenty, that's good, we'll take it. And so we said, first one at the site that we already have existing piping and everything too, we just need to make that connection. So that's the easiest one. Second tank we can work on as we get additional funding. Now, and here again, I'm not an expert in this world, but I was under the impression that every zone is supposed to be independent. They're supposed to be, and they were designed that way originally but we changed it, and that was part of the capital improvement pr projects that we did. We included pressure reducing valves. So now, if we have to take one tank out of service, maybe recode it or clean it, we can still move water yeah, into I, the pipes I, from the upper I, zone. I, I understand that, and that makes a hell of a lot of sense to yeah, me. Yeah, it was an improvement. But if I look at the, the zones, I know the 750 zone is not capable of handling it its job. Right. Now, where is the other area that can't handle its job? The 850, the 800 tank, I think, has sufficient water for that zone. You're talking about where would the second tank go? Yeah. I believe it's in the 1000 zone. At where? I believe it is in the 1000 zone. I'd have to look at a map because I have it visually where it is, but I don't know the, which zone okay. I'm looking at in my head right now. But I believe it's the 1000 zone. Okay. And it would just add additional storage at that level. Again, it would back up all of zones because yeah. we can move the water through pressure reducing valves. I don't have anything else, but thank you for coming down. Sure, absolutely. Any other questions? I don't have any. Not necessarily of you. No. Okay, thank you. Again, Carrie Larson, resident. Um, let's just say it ends up costing $11 million. Okay. And let's just say that we get no, um, oh God, I'm having a brain fart on the word. Grants. Free money, no. grants, thank you. Um, no grants at all, no word of money. So we have a proposed total const uh, new connection fee for new builds of $6,391. 3,000, is it only the $3,000 that would go back to, or would you take some of that $3,391 and also pay back? 
No, the system development uh, approval charges that are in your service rules already are earmarked for different things already, debt repayment, things like that, and for operational dollars. The $3,000 additional fee would only be for new development, and that would only be, pa that would be a pass-through straight back to Fort Mojave Fund. I hope that answers the yep. question. Okay, so let's do some math. We have $11 million divided by $3,000 per new connection, that's 3,666.66 units, new units. The statutes require 700 gallons per residential unit or residential equivalent. So we're gonna take $3,666 times 700 those 3,666 units require 2.56 million gallons of storage. You have not paid for the 2 million gallon tank before you've ran out of capacity for that unit. Thank you. That is the storage also accounts for what we have the ability to move within the system. So it's not a hard number of 3,600 and some odd units, because some of them are gonna be more or less. You might have a multifamily development, you might have a gas station, you might have a single family residential, you might have a hospital. All of those have different storage requirements and different requirements in terms of what's in there. So we took an average across the board. We know that as long as we are making that movement forward, that this kind of logic is just a way to try and say how can we pro rata share collect money to pay for that first tank and getting us that two million gets us well into that range that NDP wants us to be in for moving with additional development demands. Any other questions? It's Gary Isaac, 3687 West Cliff. I want to make the board aware of the fact that the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation doesn't like the idea of loaning money to build houses in a situation where we have inadequate water support for fire protection. That means we're not in the home building business any longer, irrespective of the, what, what the water district says. And to Evan's efforts over there, I think that's most commendable, it's wonderful. The point is we have to have local control. We need to have the study that I was promised a year ago from you and your office that shows us exactly where we are as far as residential units versus the gallonage we have today, what was grandfathered and what has been built since and what we have left over. If we build four million gallons and it doesn't do anything but hit zero spot, we're not going to have any more development other than that. So it's kind of like, why even do it? Because you're not gonna get a developer of any size down here under the presumption that the more he builds, the more they're gonna take out of him. And that's their 19% that comes out of every dollar they spend is what I fear they're looking at. And that's what we have to be worried about. I believe we need to take control of the water district again, just like we had it with Big Ben and when the, uh, Jerry was running it we then at least knew everyone was pulling on the same end of the rope. Here it looks like someone's looking for an opportunity. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other comments? Robert Bilbray, B-I-L-B-R-A-Y, 1631 Cal Edison Drive, Laughlin, representing the uh, Laughlin Economic Development Corporation. Um, I think we all want to support, be very supportive of additional development. Surely that development would be in our senior housing. There is, um, there's been a lot of casualties over the last two and a half years. A lot of casualties. Um, and call it a, a little bit of a slowdown in service. And, and, you know, just a lot of casualties. And it's, it's now not only a statewide issue, it's a regional issue. Um, and I am very disappointed that with respect to another request for a loan, 
from a related entity in the county that is not tied to any type of a change in the method or the cost in which they supply service um, is extremely disheartening. We've all been waiting for so long on, and it's a lot more than just 36 units of senior housing. I, I built South Bay, which is 303 units for, for seven and a half million dollars. We're talking 36 units with a loan now being asked of 11 million. This makes no sense, folks. Nothing that's been put before us other than what we heard with the NGO makes sense. Um, I, would, I would think that, you know, I was really expecting s something to justify this. I don't like seeing the potential of us losing a seniors project, even if it's only 36 units. Every door means something to this community and surely to those who would occupy it. Um, it's a nice, warm, fuzzy project, but it's not an $11 million project. And I spoke to the owner of the property this morning, and the Developers contractor is, is in, they're in escrow for half of it. Um, it's an incredibly low density, that property currently is zoned for 14 to 22 <laughs> units to an acre. Um, it uh, last sold many years ago for 400,000. I'll do everything I can to help that project in any way I can, but this is not the right bootstrap method for making the wrong loan to the wrong debtor on the wrong terms. And this will not be the only development we lose. It's just part of what the damage has been done to this community by the water district. And uh, thank, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Okay, we're going to call fraction. Um, okay, just, um, just discussion amongst the board or, or just to, to mention to the board to kind of recalculate or re-encompass this. So the money from the Fort Mojave Development Fund is not some illustrious fund. Those indeed is the money of our taxpayers, of our constituents, as they've purchased property. That's what is in that fund. Now, the other aspect that we need to understand is that indeed, if that is not paid back, it will become a grant. They will not hold a loan on the books at the end of 30 years, whatever's left, the Fort Mojave Development Fund has to give them. My contention has been from the onset that regardless of whether, I don't think DOA cares how it gets done, just as long as it gets done, I think she'd love to put this baby to bed. I think a lot of us would. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter how it gets done. Unfortunately, we set up the vehicle at one point, we took the surplus from the constituents, it got blown in other ways, that didn't, don't make sense to us. We were not apprised of that. But I cannot make the public pay twice no. for something that they've already paid for. Now, we want it done. We've been presented with another opportunity. But the reality is we have backed this horse. And I'm sorry, I'm not meaning to call you a horse in a negative context, but rhetorically, we have backed this horse with the water district. It led us to the situation we're in here today. And I personally would like to give someone else a chance to get in the race and see what they can do. Because these people are local, they're on the ground here, they want what's best for Laughlin, not just in this water tank. That's a start so that they can prove some credibility, so that they can show that indeed I'm able to get something accomplished for this community. But they want to help us with hospital, with senior type things. They want to help us with many things. They're an advocate for us, something we have never had in my 24 years here. I've never seen an NGO stand up to try and help this community. 
So I personally have now seen within one week, if we tabled the Fort Mojave Development Fund loan, we tabled it, and in one week, we managed to get it back. So one of the things that's been brought to us is, okay, well, we're gonna lose this housing development. And I, I do believe that there's other issues that pertain to that. I don't know, I haven't heard from the applicant where he stands on, on that, whether the grant funds have been done, timelines have been made. I, I don't know that. That is a reality of something we may lose. But it doesn't, one tank doesn't solve our problem. Two tanks gives us the ability to move forward because otherwise we're back in the same conversation. And I've seen if we do need those Fort Mojave development funds, if we get our back up against a wall within a week, we can have it back on this agenda. Yes. So I'm inclined to want to table it again, give our letter of support to Nevada by Design, have them go, have them report to this board if they'd be willing to just under the public comment section on a, on a monthly basis and let us know how that's going. And if we see that it's not going, that they're not making traction, then we can pull this back. I don't know if that will save your project, but I, I, I don't know if I can have you speak because we pulled it off from the public and now we're now speaking amongst the board. So I don't know if that will change that. I don't want to be strong-armed with your project either, nope. right? I don't want to be forced into making a poor decision because we're not even dealing with the, the reality that, and I have an attorney on this board right here that also is aware of what's called case law and legal precedent because we're not even going to get into the fact that right now there's 14 million in the Fort Mojave Development Fund. If we sell those 5,000 acres and there's half a billion, B billion, now the county has gone right into that and taken it for infrastructure. There's no saying that type of stuff won't happen. You're making a legal precedent, one that I think every member of this board is aware and is concerned about. And the type of loan, the county is the borrower and the lender, and that has never been done. It, it would not, it, our commissioner cannot have a fiduciary trust on the water board and a fiduciary trust to the constituency of Laughlin. So there's like a million of legal reasons why you just really don't want to open this can of worms and why I wanted to table it, but I understand if there were questions, but I'm still of the same mind here today. Nothing has changed to convince me otherwise than to table this. If we need to pull it off, we were able to do it in a week. So I'm impressed that the county was able, you know, to put something on our agenda in a week and we can see where if our back's up against a wall, we can definitely do it. This has been going on two years that we're aware of it from Cary, but more than 16 years. So to strong arm this board into making a decision right before an election, for whatever that's worth, um, to, you know, we'll lose a project if we don't do it, I don't think that's wise. And I don't like being put in a crisis management mode. So that's my opinion. I have also. My fear is the same as yours, is that this is essentially just a loan to the county. And once you've done that, you have set a precedent and it's just gonna be game on from there on. And then I'm, I'm really just totally against it. And so we need a motion. I just wanna say one thing. So um, I appreciate that. Uh, I want everyone to know that the Clark County is open to all options and everything. This was for us, but brought back to the table. I'm happy we had Nevada by Design present today as that was requested. I'm happy to see that their proposal going forward. I know we've worked with them since the direction from the board at that first meeting. So um, you're more than welcome to table it and we can bring it back. I know it came back quicker because we had that second meeting. So, and we had tighter deadlines. So after I got the direction from the board after the 27th, I moved quickly with the county to get it on. So, um, but like I said, the, this is, this is why we're doing it this way. This is why we're, we're, we're making sure the community and the town board has the opportunity to voice what their feelings are. So I just wanna put that out there as well, so. Thank you. Okay. Motion? Well, okay, I'll go ahead and make a motion uh, that again, uh, the town advisory board tables the motion for approval of a loan from the Fort Mojave Development Funds at this time. I'll second. second. We have a Ooh. second, two seconds. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, we'll move on to comments by the general public. A period devoted to comments by the general public about matters relevant to the board's jurisdiction will be held. No vote may be taken on any matter not listed on this posted agenda. Comments will be limited to three minutes. Please step up to the speaker's podium, clearly state your name and address, and please spell your last name for the record. If any member of the board wishes to extend the length of your presentation, this will be done so by the chairperson or a majority vote. Do we have any public comments? Three minutes. <laughs> Martin Knaus, K-N-A-U-S-S, 3826 Duke of Earl Court, uh, with the Law Firm Economic Development Corporation. The, uh, my organiza our organization is a uh, nonprofit NGO. It has requested twice through email to be put on the informational items on, the, on your agenda. Uh, neither have been responded to uh, in any short uh, shape. I would like to know, <clears throat> I realize you can't tell me here, but I would like an email back. What do we need to do? Why are we not being included? What's the reasoning? Thank you very much. Thank you. Robert Bill Bryce, B-I-L-B-R-E-Y, 1631 Cal Edison Drive, representing the Law Firm Economic Development Corporation. Um, and a, a couple long-standing open items. Um, I've been watching the Clark County Flood Control District agenda over and over and over again since the March flood of 2023. Um, as you recall, the uh, Flood Control District came to the board and indicated that the design of the detention basin at Thomas Edison, thereby protecting the edge water, the, Tropicana and everybody else was would would be approximately nine months with the development time of uh, a year, and that we, as you recall, we put a quarter cent sales tax of our sales tax into that fund, and there was plenty of money to do it. Um, I'd appreciate if the board would try to secure an updated report from the Clark County Flood Control District as to the status of that Bridge Canyon. It's, it's starting to hold up a lot of other issues upstream, uh, and, and namely Woodbury, where there's eight inch rocks going across the, <laughs> the street. So that was one item. In my past my three minutes, I've got a couple others. You got a minute. <laughs> um, we, uh, we seem to have completely dropped any method of communication with the former, with the owners uh, of the former power plant. Um, Richard Fakwawa um, spoke with myself and, and Dennis Cedarberg and everybody involved up, up until about nine months ago. Um, he has not returned phone calls. The broker for the power plant has not returned phone calls. As you recall, they said in 2017 that it's closed, that it's sold. And, um, it's uh, been a long time since 2017, and they were to identify who the buyer was, the character of the development, it's all still M2 now, and, um, and what the closing date would be. To the best of my knowledge, and I've spoken with, uh, you know, adjacent property owners, including Emerald uh, River and Richard Shaw, including um, um, the other property owners on, the cas on Casino Drive, no, no one can get contact from who represents the owners anymore. Um, and in addition to that, the school district. That was where they had a reversionary right over the 10-acre uh, uh, Bennett Elementary School. Um, they, uh, we've been able to softly negotiate the school district for the, for the Head Start program, but that's only two years. And we, we have to know what's going on with the former Bennett in a long term. And this, uh, my last conversation with the superintendent of schools at the opening was they're just not getting any type of response. And that beeps, I know, is always for me. Um, the only other thing I'd like the board to know is I have been contacted after the last fire. And in fact, there was two of them, a small one down by the, by the uh, dissipator at, 
at Heiko Springs. I've been contacted by ISO rating teams. They rate fire coverage and they rate, and they, they could impact positively or negatively the fire insurance premiums for our residents that's in their homes. I, I'll let the board know more about what I hear from it, but uh, they are very, very seriously looking at the response time, what was the response by both Clark County Fire District, whose station, whose station was that I donated was exactly a block and a half away, and uh, and they were not the first to arrive. I was there. Um, it, you know, the BLM was incredibly helpful with a with a with a bucket dump helicopter with a with a water boat. So um, I'm I'm not sure exactly what questions they're going to ask, but they directly relate to that brush fire or Nimble River. I just want to let the board know that. Um, I'll thank you very much for your time today, and I'll try to thank keep you. you informed. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, any other comments? I just uh, want to put it on there just to, for full transparency. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy around the community and the municipalities. I feel more of an obligation to put out there that since I've been here working with the Water District and Jason and his team, it has been the utmost professional and uh, they've given us everything they've needed. So regardless of how we're, we're going to continue to move through this, I think it's a great idea to keep the Fort Mojave on the table. Um, but I just want it to be known out of respect for Jason and his team. They have been completely transparent in giving us anything that we have requested when it comes to for many months the, now, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Many months. So many I just want to put it out there that just to give them the credibility of it because we have established a really wonderful relationship with them. But um, that's just the last minute I want to put out there, just a full, full, full of transparency. Another thing that it comes back from the NGO is we still have to look into all of the options that allow us under the grant title, um, uh, detailed documents that allow us to come in if there's going to be a loan. So I just want that to be put on there as well. If there is going to be a loan, if we move forward eventually with the Fort Mojave, we still need to navigate to see if that falls under that category for those grant funds. Because we can't come in and just repay a loan. We have to come in under the grant conditions to actually run the project. So that still has to get navigated. So there still is a lot to be uh, un disclosed under that. So we'll continue to navigate that. But I just wanted to let you all know that. But thank you guys for your time. Any other comments? Okay, I just want to remind everyone, Coffee with a Cop, tomorrow at 11 a.m. at Spira Mountain Activity Center. And the American Legion is also recognizing first responders from 12 to 4. Any first responder can go to the American Legion and receive um, a lunch of appreciation. And with that, I would like to call our next meeting. It will be September 24th. And I'd like to have a motion to adjourn. I moved. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Motion passed. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for coming.